to give our God who has poured his steadfast love and faithfulness into our lives. It's to give him all of the glory and all of the honor that he is due because he is worthy of it. And so let's sing now. Let's give our, our, the glory to God. Let's pour ourselves out to him. And let's sing together. from Psalm 115, verses 2 through 8, reading on from our call to worship this morning. It says, Why should the nations say, Where is their God? 
Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. But their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. And those who make them become like them, and so do all who trust in them. Psalm 115 is speaking into our existence and shining a light onto something that happens in our heart every day, and we don't realize it. You see, it starts out with a call for us to give all the honor and glory to God, which, as we sang in that song, we want to do as Christians. But so oftentimes, we find ourselves, like the ancient people of old, fashioning other things to pour our hearts out to in worship. And when we do that, when we give our hearts to lesser gods, we become deformed, right? That's that long list. They have eyes but can't see, ears but can't hear. That's what happens to us. As we worship our idols, we become like them. And instead of being changed into the image of Jesus, we are changed into the image of those lesser things that we worship. And all of us, to a certain degree, walk in here this morning, having been changed this week for the worse and not for the better. And so in that state, we come to Jesus to confess our sins and to worship him and receive his mercy. And so at this time, if you would bow your heads and confess your sins, your heart idolatry to the Lord, and then we'll come and receive his mercy together. Listen to how Psalm 115 continues. It says, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their hope and shield. O house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. In church, when we bring our sins before the Lord, and when we trust in Jesus Christ, and when we surrender to him in repentance and faith, we become like him, the most humane person to ever live, the one who is holy and exalted in glory and character. We become like him. And so, church, let's pour ourselves out to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and celebrate who he is. And let's be changed more into his image and likeness. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises what other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. 
I'll be leading us this morning in our pastoral prayer. It seems like a good Sunday to focus on mothers. Can't imagine why, right? Um, In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10, we read this. God will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. He will gently lead those who are with young. Speaking of this verse in a recent article on the website Gospel-Centered Discipleship, a pastor from Philly named Tim Shorey had this to say. I'll never see this passage, this Isaiah 40 passage, the same way again. While I have often contemplated this text, I now have a brand new lens through which to visualize it. My new visual isn't of a literal shepherd carrying a real lamb in his arms, but of the thousands of Ukrainian mothers, maternal shepherds, embracing their children in their arms, resting them on their hips, carrying them upon their shoulders, and pressing them to their bosom. What we have all seen recently, what we have all seen recently, are wrenching images of people in exile and of little ones being gathered, handheld, comforted, and carried as they go. These images of mothers bleed tender, devoted love, watchful care, worrisome toil, and profound grief. It's a beautiful picture. It's a hard picture, which is sort of what Mother's Day is. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, 
so often we go wrong in one of two ways. We can assume that something important in our life has ultimate meaning. That's one wrong way to go. Another way is to say that if something isn't the most important thing, then it's not the most ultimate thing, then it's just not important at all. But neither is true. Lord, help us to see motherhood fitting in this middle. Motherhood not as the most important thing in the world, but that's a good thing for us. Because if it were the most important thing, any disappointments in this area of mothers and children would be devastating. For those who don't become mothers or for those with a bad relationship with their mother or children, it would be crushing if motherhood meant everything. And Lord, I do pray for those, those perhaps many here who through Mother's Day, not maybe as crushing, but it's nonetheless hard. Perhaps life hasn't turned out the way they would have expected. Perhaps even as some are thankful for their own mothers, there's a sadness over the loss of a mother who's passed away or when a mother-child relationship is currently strained. Lord, we pray for those who feel motherhood is hard. On the other hand, Lord, even as we feel motherhood is hard, our feelings say something true. That is, that motherhood is important. Everyone who is alive came from a mother. A mother who made a decision to sacrifice, to sacrifice measures of comfort and health during pregnancy and afterward to bring us into the world. That's important. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for the godly mothers here. And we pray for those who feel tired and frazzled because the calling upon them is weighty. Whether through the sleepless years of young children or through the chaos of school years or through the weight of anxiety that can come through the empty nest years. Lord, give the women here among us your strength, the strength to live for you in a world that's very harsh. Lord, help the men here and all of us together, men and women together, to work toward the place of free, flowing honor and mutual respect, rather than a place of strife and competition or jealousy. And Lord, we pray for the children who are growing up here under the care of mothers. May you cause our children to thrive, to grow up to be godly men and women who love you, love your word, love your church, and serve you all of their days. Thank you for the many, many women here at our church who serve so faithfully in all the different ministries devoted to training up children in the knowledge of you. And now, Lord, in the words from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church in Ephesus, we pray that you would do more, do more than we could ask or imagine. And to do it all in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Janice. This morning's scripture reading is Exodus 32, 1 through 6, and you can find it on page 67 in your pew Bible. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This is God's word.
Well, at this time, I want to dismiss the children ages four through first grade. Um, you know, as they're leaving, we're going to get to our kind of continuing our sermon series through the book of Exodus on this special Mother's Day passage. Um, <laughs> we're going to get there in a minute. <laughs> says, these guys have read ahead. Um, but just one quick announcement about children. Um, so this summer, we're going to, um, some of you will have heard this, we're going to hopefully have more children in the sanctuary um, during the services. We're going to give a break to the children's Sunday school, not, not from the youngest to kindergarten, but after kindergarten. And I just wanted you to hear it from me, a few of the reasons why, just very, very briefly. It's not going to happen until um, after, maybe the weekend of, excuse me, of Labor Day, excuse me, Memorial Day. But, but, but I want you to hear it from me. So just a couple reasons. Uh, one, one is just rest. Um, our children's ministry workers need, need, need seasons to work and to rest. And I know one of our pastor elders, we were talking about this, and he said, there are three reasons I was able to do a decade of children or youth ministry, June, July, and August. <laughs> Every, you get to May, and you're like, I, I can't go another year. You get to August, and you're like, I can do it. I like, I like kids again. <laughs> so uh, we want our youth leaders and student ministry leaders to, to like kids, and because um, I know they do. The other reason is just, you know, I don't want to critique at all what parents and families do here at church, but, but many of our children, their predominant experience of church is going to a classroom, and we want them as they leave to be men and women who can make choices about how to find a biblical church that has biblical liturgy and, and biblical worship music and biblical preaching, and, and so, so we just think being a san- part of the sanctuary, at least for some of that time before they launch off, um, is a good experience. So if you have questions about that, come, come see me. That'll start in a few weeks. And I just wanted to mention it now. So as we turn our attention to the lovely Exodus 32, which is there for our good, uh, would you join me in prayer one more time? Heavenly Father, we, we do approach this passage kind of slightly aware or soon to be aware that there's a heaviness to it. Help us to recognize that the heaviness is there for our good, that that it would be an anchor for us that has weight and gravity, that you, 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 who you are, we would experience you as someone, the one who can anchor us, not flimsy and light, but, but something sturdy and strong and good. Help us to see that in this passage. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the other day in premarital counseling, my wife and I um, were telling a couple about the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad things that happened to us on our honeymoon. Um, I've been here at the church for a few years and, and brought this up occasionally, the, the terrible nature of our honeymoon. <laughs> uh, historically, you guys all laugh really hard about it. I, I'm not sure what that says about you. Um, but we were telling the stories of, 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 of all the failures, and one of them being you know, showing up to Miami International Airport with the wrong paperwork that would let us out of the country. Actually, they said that you, your wife can leave. She has the right paperwork, but she couldn't come back with the paperwork she had. And so that didn't feel like a good thing to do uh, on our first or third day of marriage, send my wife to a country she couldn't return from um, so, <laughs> that I might not be able to get to. So, we, we, you know, so that's the start. And, and, and we mentioned how in the day, a day and a half in the middle of the honeymoon, we each got super sick. We talked about the week of relentless rain on, during the rainy season in a rainforest. We mentioned that we ran out of cash and had to buy Oreos instead of full meals. The struggles with our rental car, the delayed and missed flights, the 56 bug bites just on one arm of my wife. Which she had bug bites other places. I mean, that's all we counted. There was the mosquito net apparently failed us. And then finally, we told this soon to be married couple how it all ended. In this little country, we walked from the little airport to the little tarmac up the little stairs before we crossed the threshold of the airplane. <laughs> My wife looked at me and said, Take a good look around because we're never coming back. <laughs> that's, that's, that is. 
true story how the first week of marriage ended. <laughs> We're about to celebrate our 17th here in a couple weeks. But for all the miserableness of our honeymoon, we, did ex- we didn't, did not, did not experience the pain, much greater pain of adultery. That didn't happen then. It didn't happen since. Thankfully, Years ago, though, I heard a pastor speak of adultery as the common cold of the church, by which he didn't mean that the consequences were insignificant, but that the problems seem to come in seasons, and our church is not immune. Of course, the violation of a covenant vow is always painful and tragic. There would be, though, wouldn't there? A special pain if a newly married bride met someone on her honeymoon, right? that That would be a special kind of tragedy. And yet, this is the very language that so many authors and so many pastors have spoken of Exodus 32. Only days before this, the Lord entered into a covenant relationship with his bride, his people Israel. And Israel had entered into a covenant relationship with the Lord. And now something in that relationship, or perhaps many things in that relationship, have quickly gone wrong. Quickly, using the wording of verse 8. And here's the thing I want you to notice here at the beginning and then throughout the sermon as we go through this passage, it's this, that when we make God into our image, so when we take us and make us into God's image, we ruin far more than we can imagine. When we make God into our image, we ruin far more than we can imagine. My outline this morning really only has two points. We're going to talk about what happened and then what it means for us. Let's first talk about what happened. To see what happened, I think the best way is to to read this passage kind of section by section and explain a few things that take place. So part of it was already read for us. We'll read some more as we go. But let's reread verses 1 through 7 again, what Janet, excuse me, 1 through 6, which Janice read a moment ago. So if you have a Bible, just leave it open throughout the sermon this morning. Exodus 32, verses 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses had, Delayed from coming down the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and has said to him, Up, make gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And Aaron, when he saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Here we see that Moses appears to delay in coming back down the mountain. You you might remember he's up there receiving instructions. Back in chapter 24, Moses told the people, I'm going up there, wait for me. Exodus 24, verse 14. But they struggle to wait and ask Aaron, Moses' brother, the second in command, to make them something more tangible to worship. Aaron does makes them a golden calf. Note what it says about it. Aaron doesn't claim that this is a new God to worship, but rather that this, the golden calf, is the God, or the gods, who saved Israel out of Egypt. And perhaps many of you can relate to the Israelites, though. It may not seem like that, but, but I bet you can when you look at it like this. Everything about Christianity is new to some of you. Many of our people here are not third, fourth generation Christians. Many of you are learning how to be Christian wives and Christian singles and Christian husbands and parents and employers and employees and members of a church for the very first time. It's all new. What is familiar to you is what was familiar to them. They were familiar with the religion of their world, the religion of Egypt and the Worship of not the God, but God's. The Lord Yahweh was now wonderful to them. 
But he was also strange. Some parts of him may have seemed weird, different. We might use the word holy. He was other. And it was hard for them to see that God's, all the ways in which God's ways were good for them. Perhaps some of you, again, can relate to this. But, but sympathies aside, sympathies aside, what takes place at the foot of the mountain is as bad as adultery on a honeymoon. The text says they hold, quote, a feast to the Lord and get up to play. They don't play cornhole or settlers of Catan. I want to be discreet about this and how I describe it, but the word play here at the end of verse 6 has illicit connotations. In other words, they made for themselves an image of God in their likeness, which is the essence of human kind of man-made paganism religion to make God into our image, and what follows is sexual immorality. And to feel the abruptness and the irony of what took place here, let me just read for a moment the words of the second commandment coming from Exodus chapter 20, which, by the way, God had just given them. You shall not make for yourself the carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. It's possible to read the second commandment as prohibiting making all art because of what it says. But just last week, I preached about people who were specifically given, as we read, God's very spirit to, quote, excuse me, to devise artistic designs, Exodus 31, verse 4. In other words, God's very spirit helps people make beautiful art. So the second commandment is not merely about art. Here's how Aaron and the people broke the second commandment and how people break it today. Aaron was not trying to give the people other gods to worship as more important than the real God. It's the first commandment. Instead, while Moses was away and taking what they imagined to be a very distant God, Aaron tried to give the people an image of the real God, something tangible. But Aaron, in doing so, he he changed the real God into an image for worship, an image of a golden calf. Now, it's true that the the calf, the the image of the the bull or this cow would have communicated perhaps some things that are true, would have communicated strength, God's strength. That's why in financial circles, people speak of a strong economy as a bull market. Image of strength. But this idol concealed far more than it revealed. Note what author Jen Wilkin has to say about this. She writes, Think of the enormity of the lie the golden calf tells. It is small, but God is immense. It is inanimate, but God is spirit. It's location bound, but God is everywhere fully present. It is created, but God is uncreated. It is new, but God is eternal. It is not powerful, but God is all-powerful. It is destructible, but God is indestructible. We're going to see it destructible in just a moment. It is of minor value, but God is of infinite value. It is blind and deaf and mute, to use the language Ben led us through from Psalm 115. But Jen writes, but God sees, hears, and speaks. And the Lord's not happy to be changed like this. He's not happy when people make him in our likeness. Look at the next section. I'm going to read all the way from verse 7 all the way through verse 18. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation Of you. Continuing in verse 11. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? 
whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them for the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, your servants whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring. And they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets that were written on both sides. On the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on tablets. When Joshua, now just context, Joshua had gone part of the way up the mountain, but not all the way up with Moses. Verse 17, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is the noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. This, for some of us, seems like a strange passage. Not only on Mother's Day, just period. In this passage, the Lord seems ready to destroy the people. I want to submit to you that this is something of a test here for Moses. And whether he would identify with the people he was called to lead or just dump them. This is his chance. Start with me. Yet Moses intercedes for them. Moses prays for them. And Moses bases his prayer to the Lord on the promises of the Lord. You can't destroy this people, Lord, because you've promised to make them into a great nation. The children of Abraham. That's us, he says. I believe this is the kind of response that the Lord wanted from Moses. The analogy is not perfect. But let's say a husband and wife are talking about their child. Husband and wife are really struggling with their seven-year-old who's in all kinds of trouble at Target. Crazy Target disobedience, okay? And the husband has had it with the kid. He's ready to lose it. And the wife says, with a twinkle in her eye, well, we could just leave him here in Target. We can go adopt another kid, Right? Again, it's not a perfect analogy, but but in the analogy, the wife is inviting her husband to say, yeah, we can't do that. And God doesn't do that. Though he is angry, and so is Moses. As Moses comes down and meets his assistant Joshua, they hear singing, not songs of war, but songs of play. After God saved them through the Red Sea, they sing a song of celebration. Exodus 14 and 15. Here, the singing in Exodus 32 is not that kind of singing, and it's not those kind of lyrics. The songs here are that of a drunken frat party. Moses responds in a way that mirrors the Lord's jealous anger at their spiritual adultery. Look at verses 19 and 20. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf that they had made and he burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it in the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Moses breaks the most valuable object in the world. The word of God written by God himself as a way to display that they had so despised the most valuable relationship in the world. Relationship with God. And what should we make of this grinding into powder? Throwing the dust in their water source. Perhaps it's like taking a young teenager who wants to smoke one cigarette and smoke a pack. I don't know. One pastor mentioned it might have more to do with showing the absolute impotence of the idol. Nothing says defeat like being ground into powder. It's hard to tell. But now we come to the passage that I drew my title from. Moses and Aaron, they talk. 21, 23, 22, 21, 22, 23, and 24. 
Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> Last spring, I helped create the preaching schedule for the next year. And I planned, uh, this is guys are already laughing. <laughs> it's been a, been a joke around the office. I planned the, the Exodus series and, and, uh, and I gave the sermon titles a whole bunch of goofy placeholder titles. They were never meant to really be published. We were never going to use them. They were just ways for us to keep track of who was preaching what. And so, for example, um, two weeks ago, Pastor Ben was preaching, um, um, you know, 25 through 30, and, and all the stuff that had to be built for God's tabernacle, God's special tent. And I gave the, that sermon the title, Camping is Intense. Okay. You can hear the dad joke in there. Thank you. Right. That's kind of how they all were titled. And... Uh, you know, 40 others of those, and I, we, didn't, we didn't use any of them, hardly, but, but we did keep the one for this sermon, or at least I kept it, which is this, it just sort of, you know, happened. <laughs> Moses comes down and asks his brother, what did these people do to you that you let them break loose? Moses assumes the people must have tortured Aaron or something, used enhanced interrogation techniques, perhaps waterboarded him. Moses is thinking, surely it didn't just, you know, happen. As you compare the account at the beginning of the passage with Aaron's account, they're very similar, but for a couple changes. The people did this, and I did that, and then, well, it's crazy, right? This calf just sort of came out of the fire. Above, we read that Aaron was the one who took an engraving tool, fashioned the calf himself, verse 4. Here, when confronted by Moses, Aaron leaves that part out and he blames the people. Several pastors have pointed out how Aaron makes himself into a minor character in the plot. We're getting long on time, so I, I just want to summarize the rest of the passage. We won't read it longhand, and then we'll talk about what it means for us. So, the rest of the passage goes like this. So, after this, Moses calls all those who are on the Lord's side to come to him. And they go through the camp and slaughter some of the people, perhaps presumably, really, killing the ringleaders responsible for the idolatry. Then Moses talks with the people, and then he talks with the Lord about whether their sin can be atoned for, verses 30 through 34. And then for the final verse in the passage, we read that a plague broke out upon the people. Verse 35, a very ominous ending. Plagues are only for the Egyptians, right? Idolatry, as I said at the start, ruins more than we could imagine. Next week, Pastor Ben will preach part two of this story from Exodus 30 and 34. So what does this passage mean for us, right? I'd love to take an hour and give you 10 things. We could talk about the importance of godly spiritual leadership in restraining people. This passage teaches us when we're thinking rightly, you should want a leader who would be willing to restrain you from you. We talk about that. The algorithms of social media, the algorithms of news media curate for you exactly what you want, and that's dangerous, especially when we do it with church. We could talk about the essence of pagan religion, that is, religion that seems to worship other gods, but it's really only transactional. In paganism, and kind of nominal Christianity, that's Christianity in name only, the gods are not really there to be worshipped, that is, worshipped in and of themselves. The gods are just there to give you what you want. And the worship is really about the worship of self. Notice the language in verse 8 to describe their sin. God says, they turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf. They made it for themselves. If your God is merely a bigger version of you or merely the same version of our cultural values writ large, then 
we might not have the real God. We could talk more about that. We could also talk about the way that Exodus 32 is replaying the story of Genesis 3 over again. Just think about that for a minute. you got Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. God puts Adam and Eve in the paradise. And then so quickly, Genesis 3 happens. Adam and Eve doubt if God is really good for them. Did God really say? They wonder. The parallels with Exodus 32 abound. Did God really say he's nearby? Did God really say don't make an idol? We could put side by side the fall of Adam and Eve and the fall of the Israelites in both. There's a doubt that God is good. God is present, which he is, all of those things, present and good. We talk about that. And we could talk about this too. You sometimes think that your main issue is to be saved from all the things outside of you. All the problems and all the enemies around you. Most of Exodus actually reads this way. So far in the book of Exodus, the great enemy of the people of God is those outside of the people of God. So far in the book of Exodus, the great enemy is Pharaoh and the seductive powers of Egypt. But here in verse 30, or chapter 32, a critical point in the story, this story and the whole of the biblical story is made. In Exodus 32, you see that not only must you be saved from external threats, but God must save you from yourself. That's worth talking about. So how shall we end this sermon? I think the safest thing and the best thing to do with a passage this big, not only its size, but in its weight, is to do this. I want to read from the Apostle Paul's reflections upon Exodus 32. It feels the best and safest way to end the sermon. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is on page 900 if you want to turn there, if you want to use one of the pew Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul has this long discussion, largely about Exodus 32 and what it means for those people and really for you and I in light of Jesus Christ. And I, I want to let Scripture guide us in how we understand Scripture, which is a good principle. So I'll pick up in verse 6 of the Exodus. Paul says, Now these things, took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. Continuing in verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Now, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And you hear that admonition towards humility. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Encouragement there. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Verse 14, final verse I want to read. Therefore, my beloved, he writes, as I would say to you, flee from idolatry. Paul says these things to a church that is people who believe, who he believes have been loved by Christ. People who have found forgiveness in the gospel. People who have found forgiveness in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, just a few chapters before, in chapter 6 of this same letter, after listing a whole bunch of horrible ways to be a sinner and be excluded from the kingdom of God, Paul says, and such were some of you. (laughs) And then he adds, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, You were Egyptians, but the love of God has changed you and is changing you and will change you. And those who have been loved by God, those who have been changed by God, this same God charges you to flee from idolatry. Whatever place in your heart you feel it saying this morning or throughout the weeks, God, wouldn't it be better if you were like this? I know your word says this, but wouldn't it just be better if you were like this and not like that? What what God is telling you right now 
is that this way of thinking leads to death. But taking God at his word, taking him as he is, the God who is who he is, is not only the best way to take him, it's the only way. Let me lead us in prayer and invite the worship team to lead us in song. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I know and I confess even now there's a, there's a part of my heart that just once on a Mother's Day Hallmark cards, just, just something light, something to pretend for the moment. And yet the way of everlasting, the way of joy, the way of back to you is an awesome thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a holy thing. And so, Lord, remind us this morning that that way is there for our good. And, Lord, for those that that don't know that way, don't know little of you and feel on the outside because in many ways they are. They don't don't know the joy of a relationship with Jesus. Lord, would you break in and show yourself strong and show yourself near We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you would stand with us. And our passage this morning leaves us a little bit on the the precipice of something. But we in Christ know that for all of us who are idolaters, that the blood of Jesus is sufficient for us. And so let's lift our voices now and thank him for that as we close. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. the one who paid 
my death and raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raise this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raise this life up from the Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, as we close our service this morning, uh, I'll just mention that we as a church family would love to hear from you. And so um, if you look in your pews there, you'll see that we have connection cards in each of the pews. You can write a prayer request on there. You can say that you're new and would like to hear more information from us. Any of those things, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you fill one of those out, you can drop those in the offering baskets that are located um, on the wall by each of the two entrances to the church here. And uh, as well, we'd love to remind you that you can give either in person here in those offering boxes or online at our church website. The last thing I'll say before we close is that if you'd like prayer this morning, if something is going on in your life, if you'd love to make us aware of something, if something from the sermon struck you, please find one of us with an orange lanyard, and we'd love to take the time to sit with you and pray with you. As we close today, hear this word of praise to our God and King, Jesus Christ, the true God who is worthy of our worship. It says, to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Go from here as those empowered by the Holy Spirit to love and honor our King Jesus. You're dismissed.